Okay. I'm back. Y'all ready to make a podcast? I am. <laughs> I think Gabriel might not have his headphones right. on. Sorry, I got I slacked from. I say, this is an audio show. You guys need to actually use your words. We gotta be. We gotta be on it. All right. All right. Um, yeah. Shall we kick things off? Do you do you yeah. have the soundboard now? You play music. I do. The music. Can you hear that? I can. Okay, Nick, you heard that? Yep. All right. Here we go. Party time, y'all. Hello and welcome to JS Party. This is K-Ball. I'll be your MC this week. I'm so excited to be back on the show and these guys miss me so much they let me run things today. Um, I am joined <laughs> by the one and only Jared Santo. Jared, how you doing? What's up, man? Good to have you back. Yeah, yeah. And Nick Nisi. Hoi, hoi. Welcome back. Hoi, hoi. I cannot tell you how much I've missed that hoi, hoi. All right. <laughs> So today, y'all are going to indulge me and talk about something that I have been digging into quite a bit over the last three to six months, um, both while I was gone, but even some before that, which is the subject of GraphQL. Mm -hmm. And I think from what I was hearing, y'all have different levels of experience. So obviously, I'm going to pick on you a lot and make you explain things so that uh, we get that played out in front of everybody. But uh, let's start with just kind of describing... What is GraphQL? And I actually want to want to hear everybody's answers, starting from the least knowledgeable. So, Jared, you said you had only played a tiny, tiny bit. From your perspective, you. what is GraphQL? Yeah, so I've talked about it a lot, but I haven't used it a lot. Most of my experience with GraphQL is uh, toying with it with the GitHub API. And so I can tell you what I think GraphQL is as a noob, and that would be an API architecture wherein the API clients are allowed to craft queries and mutations uh, according to what's been laid out by the API provider and can put together the exact data they require to uh, suck down into their little API clients. There's probably more to it than that, but that's my noob description. How'd I do? Not too bad. Not too bad. Nick, do you want to add or amend anything on that? Yeah, so uh, previously I've used uh, libraries like D3 and Chart.js to make these graphs, but uh, this is the next iteration on that, a full language to create awesome graphing quick <laughs> libraries. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I, I think that that's, that kind of goes to my understanding of it. Um, it's all schema driven and type safe, so um, the queries know exactly what they can pull and exactly what they will get back. Uh, which is pretty cool. And um, it, as opposed to something like REST, where you have like specific endpoints to fetch things from, you kind of just have like a grab bag endpoint where you can just say, this is what I want. And this is all of the properties that I would specifically want on that. And then you can have relationships between that. So like one example uh, that I always think of is like pulling a tweet. You can get, grab the tweet, but then you can say, I also want the number of likes that it has. And then I also want the replies to that, which would be other tweets that are all related to that top tweet, which mm -hmm. may or may not be correct, but that's the way I at least think about it in my mind. Yeah, How does I like this metaphor that. apply, Gabe, also? Uh, the, the server metaphor, you're at a restaurant, right? An API, I think of it like serving up stuff, you know? So a REST API where you have endpoints that it's just described, this would be like where your waiter comes and they're like, here, here's the menu, right? What, what would you like to order? And you say, I'll take a hamburger. And they say, okay, I'll go get you a hamburger. They send it back. Whereas maybe a GraphQL API is more like an open buffet where it's like, here's all of our food. You know what's in front of you. Pick and choose what you want. Make your plate mm -hmm. and take it back to your table. No? But that doesn't sound good in these times, at least. <laughs> that would, yeah, make GraphQL very uh, contagious. Dangerous. It's dangerous. Dangerous. Yeah, I mean, I feel like you two have summed it up pretty well. I'm not sure I dig the metaphor, but one of the ways that 
one of the, the layers that I would put on top of that is, if you think about a REST API, everything is centered around resources. And each resource has its own place that you go and get it. But if there are relationships between those resources, you have to, on the client side, understand those relationships and go and fetch the pieces that you want. GraphQL starts from also having a whole set of resources. That's the schema that you're talking about, the schema-driven nature of it. But it maps out the connections between those resources so that anytime you are accessing one resource, you can specify all the graph of relationships you want to follow down and pull data from. And then the other piece in terms of having the single place to go, it is one location, one endpoint, but there's this set of top level queries that you can run that where the API provider still gets to define like what are the ways into my buffet so to speak. So, oh, I knew it was coming back around. See, you, you actually do like this metaphor. The more you think about it, keep going, please. Oh, I'll play with anything you give me. You know that. <laughs> but uh, so you can't necessarily grab at the top level every resource that you might want to access. Some resources might only be accessible within the context of another resource. And the options that you have available are those top level queries. So you can think of everything within GraphQL that you're querying as a graph that starts with a single node at the top, which is a query. So query is the top, and then it steps down a relationship to, here's a set of queries that are available. Maybe, oh, let's use the GitHub API as an example. If we look at the GitHub API, what are the queries or public schema that's available? GraphQL API queries. Like the first one that it lists is marketplace listings. So that would be one hop down that's going to give you a set of thing of listings in the marketplace. And from that, you can, does that have any relationships? That actually doesn't have relationships. But um, from that, you can kind of hop down and ask for the sets of things that you would want from that query. Um, so say we were doing your buffet query. You might say that you can only start with pancakes or eggs and those are the top level things you can't just get bacon on its own but you could get buffet. eggs with a relationship to bacon or you could get pancakes and a relationship to bacon right like you have this these sort of entrees into the api that you can start with and then you can follow down the relationships as far as you go what kind of buffet doesn't have bacon as a top level entry come on just start with the bacon and go from there well, that's API design, right? <laughs> like, so one of the things I thought actually before I started dealing with GraphQL is, okay, everything's there. Where's the API? Like, do you still have to design your API? And that set of top level queries actually makes a pretty big difference in terms of how do you think about exposing things in your API? What are the core concepts that are the ways that people can enter into this thing? And maybe you want to expose everything at the top there. Maybe every resource that you have has a top level query. So, you know, I can always start with bacon and then get the things related to bacon. And I can always start with something else and get the things related to that. But that may not be the right answer. Isn't it like REST APIs in that way? I mean, your endpoints are your top level menu items, right? In yeah, in, in many ways, yes. It's like if you had a, a REST API, but at every point that you had a REST API, instead of just getting back any sort of, like say you have a relationship ID, a foreign key. In a traditional REST API, you'd get that key and then you'd go fetch the resource for that key from another endpoint, the resource for that endpoint. Here you can just say, I want to follow that relationship. Give me back all the data. Why is that better? There's a couple of reasons why it has advantages. It also can have disadvantages. I think it's, it's really interesting to look at what are some of the pros and cons of GraphQL, because this is not a panacea. It's not a better for everything. Um, one of the ways in which it is better is it reduces the number of network hops or network calls that you're going to have to make. So if you think about a, especially like on a mobile phone or something like that, you want to be making as few calls over the slow part of the network as possible the slow part of the network is between the phone and the API server. So if you can consolidate that all into a single request, 
and pull back only the data you need, you can be much more network efficient. Even if on the back end, like one way that you can implement a GraphQL server is have a wrapper around a REST API. That may still be valuable, but then all those independent API calls are happening in your data center network, which is super fast. Can we pause for a second, K-Ball? Because you're not used to having a desk mic. I think when your hand hits your desk, there's a bump on the mic. You got it. Yep. Just, I am just not that. used to this at all. Yeah. For, for <laughs> listeners, I'm in a weird situation because where I normally record is currently being used as a clinical office. Yeah. So I wanted to say that before I got too deep into it. We had a bunch of bump sounds. So <clears throat> yep. Sorry I will keep that. my hands off. Thank you. Go, go ahead and continue. Where you're... Um, let's see. Where were we? Um, this might be a good time to actually talk a little bit about some of those benefits and drawbacks. I'd be once again curious, Nick, it sounds like you've been playing with it a little bit. What have you found to be good or bad as in your first look? Yeah, so um, some. I guess I'll start with the bad first. Uh, it's an, an, another layer on top of things to learn. Uh, there's this whole like language for like defining a schema or defining your query that you have to learn. So there's syntax involved around that. Um, it's got types to it, which are different from like the way you define TypeScript types. So you have to learn that, like you, you have to keep those separate. And then um, there's, what else? Um, I could be wrong about this, but don't you have to explicitly define everything that you want to get back? Whereas with like a REST endpoint, you can just say like, give me back all the bacon and it'll give you back whatever it has. All the on bacon, that. yeah. yeah. With this, yeah, it is much more verbose. Yeah, mm -hmm. and sometimes I don't know what I want. And so that's, that's bad. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's harder to programmatically explore in that way, though it does expose an endpoint that lets you programmatically explore what the schemas look like. Are you talking about like the, is it called graphic, like GraphQL, like that tool area? Yeah, or I mean, so your GraphQL server, actually, I don't know necessarily if that is, I think that that is part of the spec. I know it's a part of the GraphQL server we've been using. It has a schema endpoint where you can just your client can fetch back here's the schema for all of the things mm -hmm. and then you could programmatically explore what's in there or not but if you're just poking around at it yeah it is definitely more uh painful than let me fetch this and examine the data <laughs> yeah right that is one thing that i was going to put in the procon uh, or the pro category uh is that that tool and specifically like those calls that it's making to figure out what you can actually get those are um, introspection queries that it is doing on its own. And it's really cool that that's just kind of built into the spec to say like, tell me what I can do here and then bring that back. And then you can build really powerful tools like, like that. I think it's called GraphiCool. Um, that lets you like, it gives me a blank canvas to start writing a query and I can hit control space and it will tell me what I can autocomplete here and what makes sense. And it'll immediately like show a little red line on that line if it's something that I can't actually fetch or if it's not formed correctly. So it, yeah. it really does help you as much as possible uh, when you're exploring like that, which is what I've been doing quite a lot. Um, so I, I do like that. And I do like um, the tooling so far that I've been playing around with uh, is really powerful in that I basically give it like, this is what our, our database model looks like. And this is the type of queries that you can expect. And it just figures out all the plumbing for me and then gives me back exactly what I want, which is really cool. That is super cool. And I feel like, I mean, you mentioned the typing being different than in TypeScript, mm -hmm. at least with the tooling that we're using, we can, you can auto generate TypeScript types based on the queries that you're running. So you ah, that's define cool. a particular I, I, query and have it generate an explicit TypeScript type that has only the fields that are coming back from your query, which uh, lets you just kind of get really nice type end to end type safety. Is that like Apollo code gen? Yeah. Yeah, uh, so I'm playing with that too, and that is cool, but I'm annoyed with it right now because it doesn't, yeah. if you change those, it doesn't actually go and clean up the types that it created previously. So like my, re my result right now is just blow away that generated types directory and then let it regenerate everything, which is kind of annoying, but yeah, I'm sure it's something that can be fixed. But I actually go the opposite way with, um, well, so far I've gone the opposite way with, I don't really touch schema generation on my own. So I don't think about the GraphQL schema. I am using a library uh, called Nest uh, that has a GraphQL um, plugin for it. And so I define all of the types for like my, what my queries will look like 
in TypeScript with decorators, and then it generates a schema for me from that. Yeah, I think one of the really cool things that you're touching on a little bit in the tooling is all the same type of magic that you can get with a um, an IDE when you go to a strongly typed language and all of the amazing different guarantees and other things you can do, this allows you to do end to end with your API server. Yeah. Well, you were touching on discovery there, Nick, and I think it's worth pointing out, maybe it's not worth pointing out, but I'm gonna point it out anyways, that RESTful APIs in IDEA are also discoverable because of the hypermedia linking in the response. It's just that RESTful APIs in practice aren't actually don't usually implement that part of RESTful APIs, the concept. GitHub actually had a really nice hypermedia API where you could say, here is the repo and here are all of the issues. Here is, sorry, uh, the response can say, here's my repo object. And in, as a part of that object is a, a link to a URL wherein all of those issues for the repo exist. And so you could then, my point is you could also in concept programmatically crawl or discover a RESTful API like you could with the schema, what's it called? Schema endpoint, where it will tell you your GraphQL schema. Mm -hmm. And so that would have been pretty cool if it took off. Unfortunately, it's difficult to implement server side and it's just always one more thing. And lots of times that's the part that gets dropped off of the RESTful APIs, which leaves developers like us, instead of letting our tooling discover how it all works, is basically just reading the docs and saying, where are the comments? And then it's constructing the URL. So in practice, it didn't really pay off, but in, in concept, RESTful APIs also were supposed to be discoverable. And some yeah. of them are, like the better ones, the better implemented ones. I think part of what makes that hard to implement is because it requires a sort of centralization of thought because every endpoint needs to know about every other endpoint or at least all of their references. And as you say, a good API that's well and centrally controlled and designed is gonna have that, but many are not. Right. And they're developed independently, whereas GraphQL by being more rigid, it forces into everything is going through this GraphQL endpoint. So we right. know about everything. So we can force that level of explicitness. And that produces the tooling, right? The, the thing mm -hmm. that happened around RESTful APIs is because it wasn't reliable to have those linking between resources, the tooling wasn't built out in order to do the discover ability, right? The actual discovery. And so you couldn't rely on it. So habitually we, we didn't think about it. And so we always just go read the docs and find the endpoints and hard code those into our clients and whatnot. So I think a big win is that because it's there from the start by default on all GraphQL APIs, now that you can build your tooling saying it's gonna be there. And that makes a huge difference in practice. I think that's a good place to wrap to a break. Okay, boom. Okay, ball shaking the rust off. I know, I'm totally rusty, <laughs> totally rusty. <laughs> That's all right, call me on it, I love it. Well, I just, I wasn't trying That's to call you, I was just trying to make this show sound good. That's all. No, it's good. Call me on other things too. Okay. <laughs> make you're me react. Jerk. You're being a jerk, no. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> but, you know. All right, anybody need a bio break? Nope. Nope, all right, let's just roll back in. All right, so we've talked some about GraphQL as a mental model, what some of the pros, some of the cons, things like that, even some of the different tooling that it creates. Let's now dive into something a little bit more concrete, looking at what are different approaches to actually implementing GraphQL, what are the different pieces of it that you would need to implement, and maybe some specific examples and implementations. Nick, do you want to lead us off since you've been working particularly with one? Sure. Uh, so like I said, I've been using uh, Nest.js for this and it has a its own plugin uh, called Nest.js GraphQL that is actually just a wrapper on top of um, Apollo or there's another one, I think, but Apollo is the one that I'm using. Um, and oh, um, yeah, Apollo. Fastify, I think is another thing. Um, anyway, it is interesting because it lets me just like set up everything very similar in a very similar way to the way that I was setting up REST endpoints with Nest, where I can create instead of a controller to control all of the, the RESTful endpoints I have, I create a resolver and the resolver can have like a query method or 
uh, specifically like the pieces of the the GraphQL model that I want to fetch, and then it can pull that data in, do any kind of processing it needs to the query, and then pass that along to a server uh, service that can go read from the database and query exactly what I need, and then deliver that or do any other kind of processing. So it's really nice and easy to to set up. Um, that library Nest is very much in the it's it's a TypeScript first library and it's very decorator heavy, which is interesting. Um, but it does things kind of magically, but it's pretty easy to to pick up on. You used a keyword there that I don't think we actually dug into defining yet, but that is pretty core to implementing at least GraphQL servers, uh, the server side, which is Resolver. Mm -hmm. Do you want to describe a little bit what that is, or I can as take a stab at it, or whatever you prefer? As best I can, I'll try. Um, so a Resolver would be something that like provides the instructions for taking like the GraphQL string, the, the query that it receives, and uh, actually doing something with that. So passing that off to to do whatever it needs to with that. So that, that could be like, you know, making sure that, uh, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm falling apart here a little bit, but maybe like type checking arguments that might be passed in to the query or things like that could happen there. Yeah, I think that's good. The The resolvers take responsibility for mapping from the query to the data. And one of the interesting things that I've seen there is like those can be more or less granular. So you could have a single resolver that resolves all of an object, everything that it has there. Or you can actually break apart different resolvers per field in that object, depending on how your data is stored. And so if, for example, you're building up a GraphQL object out of several different objects in your database, those references to different objects could actually be in different resolvers or different parts of the object could be in different resolvers. And then if those fields aren't queried, those resolvers aren't called, you don't have to take those database hits. So it, they can actually give you a mechanism for making your backend much more efficient. Speaking of backends and efficiency, what happens on a backend when somebody crafts a GraphQL API that just spans like six of your tables and just causes all these joins. Because let's take a blog scenario, right? Blog post has comments, comments have authors, authors have blog posts. So couldn't I just say blog.comments.authors.first.blog.comments or post.com? Can I just drill down and just completely screw over your backend? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and, okay, cool. and this is actually one of the things that I saw coming into this is the first version of the GraphQL server uh, that I've been working a lot on was written by somebody who had a front end background who did not understand databases and schema. Right. And it was ridiculously slow, even in good cases, and so easy to write pathological queries that would just totally destroy the back end and take minutes to resolve. Mm -hmm. There's a few different layers to this. So one is appropriately setting up your resolvers. If somebody's asking for a particular, uh, what was your example, post and their comment and their whatever and their whatever, and they're just going down one whole thing, like your resolvers should be such that it just follows that one trail and doesn't load everything at this level and then everything at that level and then everything at that level. And you may want to set up your top level queries such that it's impossible to do something that's going to span all of those, those different things. But there are other techniques you can do. You can implement checks on how complex is this query, how much data is going to pull back, uh, various other things, and just throw errors and say, hey, no, you can't make that query. It's mm -hmm. too much. Doesn't that break the promise of GraphQL? I mean, I'm supposed to be able to just go up to the buffet and grab what I want. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Safe. It, it does, but it is still your API. And one of the trade offs that you get as you create this great flexibility is, and this great power, is there's now a great responsibility that you need to put limits on it, or you need to be confident that your backend can handle every type of query that can be crafted.
it seems like it would map well on top of a denormalized database or a, a document-based database. Whereas if you are retrofitting a GraphQL API on top of an established, highly relational, sharded even like a very established relational database that you could potentially expose more of the performance problems without, unless you take a, a very precise and extreme measures in order to stop that. Whereas maybe it's mapped on top of something that already is more document oriented. You're not going to be crossing tables anyways, because your data is right there stored in the same document. Is that a fair assumption? I think that's definitely fair. I think it's really easy to, if you're not careful, create the ability to do pathological queries. And implementing a GraphQL server on top of a, any sort of complex data situation is not a trivial task. This is something that you know, there should be somebody who's an expert in that data system on there. Mm -hmm. Though one of the things you highlight that, that is kind of interesting to explore is you can also set up what is essentially a proxy layer on top of an existing REST API. So if you have a big established working system and you have a REST API there, you can set up a proxy that just is calling out to your REST endpoints and REST is very good for cacheability. So you can have that proxy be caching things in all appropriate ways and doing managing the cache so that you can take advantage of those individual endpoints not being pathological and working well. And with that, you still get a lot of benefits in terms of you insert typing such that you have all these tooling benefits exposed to the client developers. And you get that advantage that all of those individual API have uh, requests are happening inside of your fast data center instead of over the slow public network. That's pretty cool. Coming back a little bit to implementation options. So I guess that piece of about being able to wrap a REST API, maybe you can imagine the GraphQL proxy as your bacon that you're wrapping around everything. <laughs> uh, you know, it makes everything taste better. Well played. Well, before but, you get into specific ones that you might build, I would just want to mention that what I see a lot of, which seems like is cool to try out GraphQL from a server-side provider, is probably not scalable and usable. It's like so many of these things are like, hey, we'll just generate your GraphQL API for you. Isn't that, I mean, take your Postgres database, take your MongoDB, take your existing REST API and just like slap us in front of it. And now you have a GraphQL API. I see a lot of those tools and I, they are shiny and neat. And I, I would play with them, but I wouldn't necessarily think to roll that out on my production system. It, am I off base that on that? I don't think you're off base at all. I think that those are, I mean, similar to kind of vanilla active record that you might get in Ruby on Rails or vanilla, what have you. They're great for fast prototyping. They're great for early projects. And as you develop scale and as you have to deal with complex data, you're going to have to deal with those problems as programming problems. And you're going to have to think about your schema design. Cool. So kind Nest, coming... Nick, that's just a, Nest is a specific node library that does this for you or that you use to build it? Yeah, that you use to build it. And so Nest, like default Nest would be for REST endpoints. And then they have a plugin that lets you, okay. instead, of, instead of creating controllers for those, create resolvers for and mutations. And that's a tool like ExpressJS or like any sort of service, like as a, it's an HTTP library. Yeah. So it's a, a wrapper on top of Express too. Oh, it is. It just kind of, so it's not like Express, of everything. it's just wrapping Express. <laughs> yeah. The old Russian, the Russian of meta frameworks now. Everything's a meta framework, right? <laughs> this <laughs> is true. That's so where the interesting stuff is happening. I like to get close to the metal and use ExpressJS. That, that's kind of one of the, the downsides uh, that I didn't mention is if you just wanted to like do a quick query, like there's there's a lot of a lot more ceremony around making a request. Whereas with a REST endpoint, I can just you know from my my DevTools console use fetch and grab the data, and I can right. still do that, but I have to know exactly how the query is formed, like in that RESTful call, and how arguments are passed and things like that, and send it along. Um, but then another thing that has always confused me when I look at REST is, or uh, sorry, GraphQL, is there, there seem to be, well, are there different flavors of it? Apollo seems like a, 
a flavor. I don't know. I, I might be referring to it incorrectly, but I always hear it referred to as like a flavor of GraphQL. Is that an accurate way of putting it? That's a great question. And I don't have a super strong sense. I think, well, let me add what a couple. What is a flavor? A little more detail on that. So there are multiple layers of, there, there have been evolutions of the spec. So as in anything with an evolving spec, you're going to have different flavors where people have chosen to, to stick at a, one version of spec and maybe haven't upgraded. Another thing that is interesting to look at and explore is that GraphQL has this uh, essentially like abstraction leaker or whatever for the, the query language, which is directives. You can define relatively arbitrary, and I haven't used this to, too much, so I don't know the boundaries of that arbitrary, but you can define relatively arbitrary new behavior and logic in your GraphQL API using directives. And these can then function essentially as decorators on your queries in different ways. So that is another way which different implementations of GraphQL can potentially create what feel like different flavors because if they have built-in decorators that aren't user-defined but are just part of when you install Apollo, you get this. Mm -hmm. But that's just that's mostly just me spitballing. I don't have a a super good sense. There's also aspects of it that are not defined in the spec but are like determined by the implementation and people are starting to figure out norms such as like how do you handle pagination and whatnot where it's like that's not formalized but Apollo does have a way that it does it and then like you can do it that way or maybe you can do it some other way yeah I had to deal with pagination recently and I I it it did not feel natural and it was something where I essentially created a different top level query and a different object that included pagination related things and then had the repeating value cursor yeah so yeah I uh, use a library called SJS query where I just give it a resolver and um, the DTO or what, what the queries will look like and it will automatically paginate everything. That's one of the cool, really cool um, libraries that we're using on top of all of this. Hmm. Interesting. What's that called? It's called SJS query. Okay. I feel like Nick probably doesn't ever actually write code. He just kind of like instructs things to do the coding for him. Like he's like, this thing's <laughs> what I use. They're and called then macros. Down underneath there, <laughs> inside my Vim macro, it does all the coding for me. I think Nick is just operating at a higher level of abstraction than the <laughs> rest of us. That's my point, yeah. He's either a wizard or a fool. I can't figure out which one. I think he's probably a wizard. Uh, I think he's a wizard. I'm really curious <laughs> how, they han how that handles pagination. So what does it do to the underlying queries? Um, I'm looking at their docs right now. Oh, interesting. So they, they do kind of a similar thing where they have a meta object that wraps the underlying objects that includes mm -hmm. a page info object and then an edges object, which has all the different, whatever mm -hmm. the results were. That makes sense. So is it that then not. built into your, so on the client side, Nick, are you doing the client and the server side in this project? Uh, like, are you the using the GraphQL API? Oh, you're not even using it yourself. Right. That is something I wanted to bring up is um, if you had any experience with like, I guess, service to service GraphQL calls, like on the server side, is that something that you've, you've handled before cable? Oh, interesting. No, it is not, uh, because all of our service to service stuff on our back end right now is using uh, gRPC. So oh. we're not currently doing that. We only use GraphQL to communicate to the client. Interesting. Yeah. So I, I've only been working on a proof of concept with this stuff for the last few weeks, and it's um, all all server side. Mm -hmm. I just wondered how the, how a client would then interact with the pagination. Like, is it maybe the uh, there's an auto-generated client that knows that you're the way that Nest does pagination. There's like a Nest client that knows that. And so they already do the pagination for you or something. That's So this, this Nest.js query will, you give it the, the objects that you're working with and it will define the schema that includes that page info and, and edges mm -hmm. um, as leaves in that, in that graph. So you can, the client knows exactly what it, 
can expect from that on any kind of pageable um, resolver. Gotcha. That's interesting. Yeah, that's. I think that's actually pretty cool how it's dealing with pagination, looking at that now. And one thing that, so is Nest, Nest only handles the server side or it's generating for you all that client side work as well so that you plug that into whatever you're doing on the client? Um, what would be required on the front end, on the client? I'd want to have access to all of the types clearly i'd like to i guess that's the main thing is the types and then whatever library is handling how it runs queries and doing caching and things like that so it's i guess the question is is it exporting all those types it has to all right i've answered my own question <laughs> that's something that i haven't really touched on yet um in my exploration and so i assume that somehow the client would be would have access to the schema is that mm -hmm. right maybe or, or like at least like it from a tooling level like it knows what it can query based on that and then tools like like apollo cogen will uh from what i've gathered that will go through like an ast walker and just find all of the the places where you're making graphql calls look at those queries and then define interfaces in typescript that match exactly what you'd be getting back or what you expect to get back yes that is correct. But and I guess my... what I would want, ideally, since Nest.js is also doing this all in JavaScript or TypeScript, I would love something that lets me have end-to-end. -end. Because right now I'm doing GraphQL in Python and then I'm on the server side and then I'm querying it with JavaScript. And there's always this step of, okay, my client thinks it's doing this. It sends this query and then the backend says, wait, what are you talking about? That's not a query, right? But presumably if you're doing everything end-to-end -end in JavaScript or TypeScript, you can deal with that and catch it at the tooling level rather than at the testing runtime level. Yeah, presumably. <laughs> I mean, I think Apollo CodeGen looks at the GraphQL schema, so it does some amount of that. I don't know. Yeah. We're getting outside of my six months experience here. <laughs> <laughs> what I've done in the past for, for that kind of sharing is, um, and not with GraphQL, but with like RESTful endpoints is, uh, I've used, uh, so Nest has a plugin for Swagger, so it'll generate auto-generate Swagger documentation for all of your endpoints for RESTful calls. And you can export that as a JSON file. And then I've just written a parser that goes through um, the JSON and creates interfaces out of that that are then just automatically generated and placed into the project. Not the, the most straightforward way, but it is a way to kind of not have to think about writing all of those interfaces. I love it. Nick, you always find a way to auto-gen, man. Generate always. <laughs> I need to suck some of that stuff into my head. You're I better at it than I am. I feel like I toil away at my code and Nick just kind of like tells things to do things for him. I should hang out with you more. Work less. All right. I think that's another good spot for a break cut. Okay. Eye breaks, anyone? Mm. Drinking water, K ball. It's like it's not like you. You're normally just running off to the coffee machine on the break. I know, but I'm not in a good spot for that I right know. now because I'm in our mostly abandoned office for the company I work at. We have to coordinate. We only allow one person in at a time right now because Oh wow, you're the one. I'm the one for this hour and a half, two hour stretch. Um but I don't think the coffee machines are on. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're happy to have you back. And in the limited capacity that we have you, we'll take whatever cable we can get. Mm -hmm. I did already drink quite a few cups this morning. So <laughs> Nick actually tried to code up an auto-generated cable, but it didn't work out like we thought it would. And uh... <laughs> Ooh, I want to hear more about that. <laughs> well, you can't because I just made it up. Nick, tell him more about the K-ball you tried to write. <laughs> well, it's just layers of abstractions. And then <laughs> if you abstract anything enough, it, you eventually just end up talking about Vim with me. So, Yeah, well, you know, now we can hang out and talk TypeScript too because I've been in that world a lot. Yes. So. <laughs> but 
Anyway, we should probably get back to out. coming around. <laughs> get back to GraphQL. Um, I was thinking just some more stories from the trenches on it, but if you all have other things that you think we didn't cover, or I guess we talk about fragments and fragment rollup. That's a kind of interesting area as well. Um, well, one thing that hasn't been covered at all, which I think a lot of people gap on, which I don't know anything about, so I don't talk about it, is like the mutation side. Like most of the stuff is about the queries and the reading and the, the data fetching, but like how do you change things, you know? And what are the, not just how do mutations work, but like what is the, your experience and the nitty gritty on that? I think that'd be worth covering. I don't have it. Yeah, to the extent I have it, which is really <laughs> relatively. And Nick, you don't either? I have okay. no experience with mutations yet. <laughs> It's like uh, the the W in the RW of an API. It's got to be read and write. You know, you got to have the yep. W. It's a read only API. Those are the. But yep. Um, actually, okay. While, while we're on break, real quick. Oh no, I don't have it on this laptop. Never mind. I was gonna pull up some of the code base that I've been working in and take a look real quick, but I don't. I'm on the wrong laptop. So. Um, all right, we'll just roll back and we'll talk a little bit about mutations and then. <laughs> Uh, we don't have to. I, I'm just that was just an idea. No, I think I think it is. Let me take a look real quick at what that looks like on the GitHub side. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. All right, let's get back into it and talk about one subject that we have not talked about much yet, which is mutations. How do you actually change data using a GraphQL API? This is something that Jared was talking about on the break. He said, well, you know, you have a read-write API. We've only talked about read. How does write work? Um, it's a querying language, not a... It's a query language. Mm. But if you're going to replace REST, REST, yeah. you've got to do some state amount transfer. of updating those things, state transfer, right? Or CRUD, create, read, update, and delete. How is that going to work? So yeah. who wants to lead us off here? I'll go last also, not at all. Yeah, I have not gone far in my POC yet, so I haven't did anything. Nick will get back to us. So it's you, K-Ball. How do you mute All right, them? that's me. So. I think the way to think about mutations is it's actually coming back to this question of query design and API design. It's much more explicit, or at least has the potential to be much more explicit. So we talked about how all the queries are this kind of graph descending from the top level query. So you have query, you define what the first level of things you're allowed to query is, and then you can follow relationships down through the different resources through the types. On the mutation side, it's similar in that you have a top level mutation object where you're defining the mutations that are allowed to happen. And I have not used this a huge amount, so I'm not an expert on this at all. And I don't actually have a strong sense the extent to which there is that same level of nesting and following relationships. But if you look at the mutations part of the GraphQL API, what you'll see is they have a shit ton of mutations defined and they're all very explicit. So whereas in a REST API, you might assume that you're gonna expose mostly CRUD functions. So you just have an update endpoint that lets you update the fields on your object. And maybe there's some permissions around that or what have you. In a GraphQL API, you're gonna have much more explicit mutations. And some of those maybe just update this object and use pass in the new object types or, or things around that. But if you look at, for example, the GitHub API, there's a lot of things about accept this suggestion, clone this thing, do this thing. You have a mutation for each type of action that you're wanting to enable. And so it feels in some ways much more like defining an internal API that you might call programmatically rather than this model that I think CRUD particularly and the combo of CRUD and REST, a lot of stuff got sort of glommed right. together where most REST APIs are just implementing CRUD functionality. This idea of I just have an object and I'm gonna give you new fields for it or new override certain fields for it. 
it's more towards what type of API would I extend inside of my project, add this thing, do this thing, change this thing, where I'm explicitly calling out the fields that I want from you. And because everything is strongly typed, I can have those fields be objects with particular types, but that's kind of where it goes. And I think you can specify you know, for an object, which fields do you accept in that mutation as well? So it may not be every field in that object, but instead say, hey, I want, you can pass in this object, but really only these fields from this object. How would you do something like a delete then? Would you say, here's a mutation called delete post and you call Absolutely. that mutation? Yep, if you look at the, once again, the, the GitHub API is a great public example and it's super well documented. They have delete issue, delete issue comment, delete label, delete package version, delete project, delete project card. All of these are top level mutations that they expose. Do each of those then have, you're now going to assume that you understand how GitHub's backend works, but each of those has then a resolver that takes care of that functionality, some sort of function that lives somewhere that says delete this thing. And then it goes and makes sure you can do that. And it has any sort of like background jobs that have to happen when that happens and it resolves that. And is that how that works on the API side? Yeah. At a I think so. Level, I'm sure there's details missing there. Okay. I'm sure there are, and there may be abstractions in there or whatever, but yeah, it's very, very explicit in terms mm -hmm. of what changes are enabled and allowed. Is there a standard for like what gets returned from a mutation? Not that I'm aware of. So in the case of GitHub's well, there's add star. Delete team discussion. The input is the delete team discussion input and the return fields is the client mutation idea, a unique identifier for the client performing the mutation. So probably a minimal response. You seem like you'd have like a success or a failure kind of a thing. But in this case, maybe if it's a success, they just return the client ID. I was trying to find delete star. I found add star. Delete issue returns uh, two fields, the client mutation ID, which is the same as the other one, and the repository that the issue belonged to, which I assume is the entire object, not just the repository ID. So even amongst GitHub's responses, it seems they're consistent, but not like identical. Depending yeah, I asked that and I was gonna kind of ask about like error handling too, um, like if there's any kind of standard for that. And, and the reason I'm asking is like, when you, when you implement this, like, like Apollo, for example, um, would Apollo handle errors like on the client side different from like another library that you might be using to hit an Apollo backend? Is, is there some kind of standard that, that is followed or is it just abstractions all the way up? That's a great question, down. and I don't have the answer for you there. Um, let me see. Where does it talk about error handling? I feel like in Apollo, what happens is it sends back <laughs> essentially a message saying, there was an error, go check your GraphQL server. <laughs> but I don't remember. <laughs> like, I don't know off the top of my head. And that definitely feels like a place where we have a little bit of a hole. One thing that is kind of odd is GraphQL will return a success code with an error message rather than it being an HTTP error. Uh, so that's kind of funky. Is they're using, so they're using think, HTTP as a transport layer, not really as. Exactly, yeah. exactly. In fact, I think it may not even necessarily like, I'm not sure that's part of the spec so much as that is just a common choice. I was going to say we have a transport layer. It's called TCP. So it seems like HTTP would be superfluous in that use. That being Yeah, said, but it makes it easy to build client-side interactions yeah. with it, right? Yeah. Like, you want to be able to hit this thing from a 
browser and it's way easier to hit an HTTP based API than a TCP based API. Right. So real time follow up on the GitHub API. The reason I couldn't find delete star is there is not one. It's called remove star. And that's, yep. the, that's the delete function is that we remove. So well, a little flexibility there because, you know, now they're, they're more semantic. Like, you don't do you delete a star, really? Well, you just kind of remove the fact that you starred that repo. So they're being a little bit more descriptive, but less discoverable because I'm everything else says delete and then it goes to star and it says remove. Yep. What you want to bet those were implemented by different teams mm -hmm. than the ones doing delete these things. There's a whole set that are removed. There's a whole set that are delete. And maybe they have an internal consistency for which things, but yeah. The fun of API design. So there's a cool question come out of the chat room from Lars. Maybe one of you two can help him out. And he asks, where do you learn the actual QL? Where do you learn the query language? What's the best resource for learning the query language? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. There's a website called howtographql.com that has sort of interactive tutorials and a bunch of stuff. And I've heard a, a few things. I've heard folks talk about that as a good resource. I have not actually used it because I learned it all on the job. So I just kind of learned it by looking at the code that we had and then sitting developers down when I got stuck and being like, what the heck is going on here? Can you explain this to me? But I've heard great things about how to graphql.com. What are you, Nick? I will definitely check that out. But mine has also been on the job learning and kind of looking at other queries. But we, like I said, this is a proof of concept. So we don't really have like established queries lying around anywhere. So it's more just what have I typed into um, the graphical interface? And then I heavily rely on the, the control space to tell me what I can and can't do mm. in this. And then it's like, it's like throwing spaghetti at the wall to see what sticks. Then you also got the Eventually up arrow. You know, you can go back to your history. What have I typed before? <laughs> up arrow, up arrow, up arrow. What's, what's an arrow key? Sorry. Uh, L, J, K? I don't know. K. K. Okay. Uh, GraphQL.org itself is also pretty good. It's got reasonable learn resources, though they also reference straight out to have, how to GraphQL for doing tutorial related stuff. They've got a bunch of interesting things there. Why don't I say I that the query language the itself source? is simple, simple enough that everything I needed to know at the time that I was using it was basically just like clicking and seeing in the graphical editor the query that it generated based on what i was trying to do and it's pretty straightforward to just copy and paste that around and you know tweak it so i didn't feel like there was all that much to learn on that side which is probably one of the reasons why it is so beloved by front enders and people who just want to get their data and get on with their day is that there's not too much to learn on the query side on the implementation side and maybe on the mutation side as well i'm not sure it seems like there's a whole bunch there but just yeah. the language itself is pretty basic. Absolutely. Well, and I think that's one of the one of the easy gotchas in GraphQL is folks will come in, and particularly folks who are just on the front end side will come in and say, "Hey, this makes my life so much easier. Let we can just throw it in, and it's going to make everything golden." And what I have seen having to do a lot of retrofitting work on the server side here is that that approach leads to catastrophically slow GraphQL servers <laughs> and poorly designed schema and various other things. So this is a real domain. There are real concerns. And if you're creating that server side implementation, it's going to go a lot better if you have some understanding of your underlying data systems and how they work. Mm -hmm. One aspect of GraphQL we haven't brought up, which I think is the coolest use case of it so far, is the way that Gatsby uses it to normalize all these disparate data sources into a single GraphQL usable thing. And I yeah. know there's a lot of complexity in those things. And of course, you could have 
especially if you're spanning multiple data sources and stuff, it could get real hairy. But conceptually, I think that is super rad. I think it's the coolest thing about Gatsby. It is super cool. And it, it lets them create a dissociation between data source and accessing that data source. So all mm -hmm. that you have to do to incorporate a new data source with a new way of interacting is you write something that knows how to translate from that to GraphQL. And then your client code just behaves in the same old way it's always behaved. And I think that is a really neat way to do it. And they do it at build time. But one could imagine doing that in real time too, in that wrapping approach that I mentioned, where you wrap around all sorts of different APIs and provide a single consistent interface to them. You're not gonna have me disagree with wrapping. Once again, GraphQL is the bacon that's gonna make everything better. But if you're not careful, you'll get a little bit bloated if you have too much bacon. <laughs> Badoom. Ching. You don't know how much I've missed playing with these puns and metaphors with you all. <laughs> all right. Well, Anything else that y'all want to talk about or ask about on GraphQL while we're here? Oh, one thing we didn't talk about was this concept of fragments, which I think is also quite interesting, particularly on the client side. So fragments allows you to essentially take sub pieces of a GraphQL query and treat them as their own individual queries, but then kind of roll them up so that you only do that one big query at the top. So in the code that I'm working with right now, each component thinks in its own set of data that it's gonna run or that it's gonna query and it writes a fragment. But then the top level page loads up all those fragments, composes them into a single query and it only hits the API once. So it lets you as a developer think only about the data that you need for the piece that you're working on. But then from a performance standpoint, you can normalize all of that. So you're doing a single query that's going to generate the info that you need and send that all at once to the server and get it all back right on page load. Another and nice some, thing with fragments is that it will, uh, it'll give you an interface name in TypeScript with, with like Apollo code gen, for example, mm -hmm. that is the name of that fragment. So if you need to reference that type later, you easily have access to it and, and can pull it from there because otherwise it gives it some really funky name that's like the, whatever the query name is, underscore uh, result, under, like just a lot of underscores in there, which looks ugly. Yeah. So yeah, fragments are super interesting area and there are tools like Relay, which will automatically roll up all those fragments, but it's also not super hard to kind of explicitly roll up and import your fragments. With that, I think we've covered a heck of a lot about GraphQL. Thank you for indulging me. This has been fun. Uh, we'll sign off till next week. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, Nick. Yeah. And mm -hmm. the party will continue. Same time, same channel next week, 10 o'clock Pacific and whatever time it is for y'all. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. All right. Kibal's back. You did it. <laughs> uh, definitely noticing a little bit of rust. But a little rusty on the sign-off. I can tell you like, how uh, I yeah. stop talking? Ah, like, oh, guys, sign <laughs> off. What do I sign off with? Ah. Yeah. Oh, funny.